Every course and textbook starts with an attempt to define economics. Definitions differ, but after you hear a few of them, you should have a flavor for what economics is about. When I tell people I'm an economist, the first thing they usually say is either, what's the stock market going to do next? Or, how should I invest my money? I'm always sad to hear those questions. There are two reasons why. The first reason is that I don't have good answers. There is some interesting economics behind why I don't have good answers, but this is not the time to talk about that. The second reason why those questions make me sad is that economics isn't really about money or stocks. Well, it is partly about money, but money and stocks and other financial subjects are only part of economics. Personally, I don't find finance to be a very interesting part of economics. Others, of course, do. So again, what is economics? Let's see some definitions. Greg Mankiw's introductory textbook, or as he would say, his favorite textbook, says economics is the study of how society manages its scarce resources. This is not a bad definition, although it would be more accurate to say that economics is the study of how individuals manage scarce resources. Gortney et al. define economics as a study of human behavior, with an emphasis on human decision-making. That's a pretty good definition, too, although it's worth pointing out that economics is a study of human behavior, not the study of human behavior. Other disciplines also study human behavior. Stephen Landsberg's Intermediate Microeconomics book defines economics as one of several sciences that tries to explain human behavior but it differs from other disciplines like psychology and sociology in that it emphasizes rational decision-making. I really like this definition, but there are some, like Dan Ariely, who are economists but heavily emphasize the ways in which people engage in irrational behavior. Also, economists have begun crossing over into what were once considered sociology, psychology, or even demography. It's harder than it used to be to say, this is economics and that over there is not economics. The first time I took an economics class, I was given a definition something like this. Economics is a study of how people choose to allocate scarce goods and resources to satisfy their unlimited desires. Again, this is a pretty good definition. It has individuals choosing and scarcity, themes that will come up again and again in any economics course. This definition provides a good opportunity to define some other terms that are important in economics. Goods are things that people like to use. We say that people consume them. Bads are things that people must be paid to accept. For example, a sandwich might be a good, if you like sandwiches, and garbage is probably a bad for most people. To convince you to take my garbage, I have to pay you. Resources are what we use to make things. Labor, tools and equipment oil, timber, iron, and so on. They're all resources. I've sometimes heard people use this definition as well. Economics is the study of how people respond to incentives. This definition embeds a lot of the information from the other definitions in a succinct form. People who respond are choosing. Incentives are reasons to do things, and as we'll see, changes in scarcity tend to change incentives. Like a lot of interesting ideas, it's hard to succinctly describe economics in a way that covers all possibilities without being trivial or meaningless. Next, we'll look at some key economic concepts. Once you've heard them, you'll have a better idea of what economics is and how economists think. Ultimately, however, the only way to figure out what economics is about is to do some economics. We'll get to that in future episodes. Economics textbooks often have a list of important economic concepts somewhere near the beginning, although they differ from text to text. I'm going to present just three key economic concepts, but I'll sneak in a few additional ideas through each key concept. Scarcity means that stuff is limited. We can't all have as much of everything as we like. Maybe we'd all like to have big houses with swimming pools and a bunch of robots to clean it for us. Or maybe we'd all like to get the latest electronic gadgets or the fastest car or whatever. Right now, however, it's not possible for us all to have everything we want. Maybe we could all have big houses, but not if we all also want to eat and have fancy electronics and so on. We have to give up something to get the thing we want because resources are scarce. Every time resources are used to make one thing, that means they are not making something else. Therefore, we have to make trade-offs. We must trade off one thing for another. 
put it another way, we must make choices. I can spend a dollar on an apple, but that means I can't use that dollar to buy an orange. This holds true for everything. Every choice we make involves doing one thing instead of another. The value of the best thing we give up is called opportunity cost. So if I choose to spend one dollar to buy and eat an apple, and the next best thing I could have chosen was a one dollar orange, then the orange was the opportunity cost of that apple. Economists focus on opportunity costs as the true cost of making a choice. The opportunity cost is not necessarily the same as the monetary cost. Notice that I did not say that the opportunity cost of the apple was one dollar. Scarcity and trade-offs can be summed up by the acronym TANSTAFFEL, which stands for There Ain't No Such Thing As A Free Lunch. If goods and resources are scarce, then nothing is free. Everything you get requires giving up something else. I sometimes have religious friends or students who try to argue that salvation is free. Or environmentalists might argue that enjoying nature is free. But they're both wrong. Salvation costs you at least a few minutes that could be spent doing something else. And it probably requires giving up lots of fun sinning. Enjoying nature isn't free either, since that nice nature stuff could be used to do something else and your time enjoying it could be spent playing, say, video games instead. Salvation and enjoying nature might be worth your while, but they're not free. They might, however, be zero price. That is, one might not have to actually pay money to enjoy them. Economists are famous, and sometimes mocked, for assuming that people are rational. We know that people aren't really always rational, and some economists have made their careers on finding the ways in which people can be relied on to be irrational. Still, when doing economics, we usually assume that people behave rationally. By rational, we mean something like people tend to choose the correct means to achieve their goals. Why would we assume something that we know to be false? Because it's a useful lie. No, I'm serious. Economists routinely use simplifying assumptions which are useful lies that make the world comprehensible. We use these assumptions to build models, which are frameworks for trying to understand a part of the world. Without simplifying assumptions, the world is too complicated to understand. For example, if you want to understand how flight works, you don't build a complete airplane from the ground up with ailerons and rudders and flaps. You build a simple little fixed wing and then you blow air over it to see what happens. Once you understand the simple model, then you can make it more complicated. Economists assume rationality because it is a useful lie. It is a useful assumption because it predicts so well in so many circumstances, particularly the sorts of circumstances economists have traditionally studied. We know it's not always correct, but rationality is a powerfully useful simplifying assumption. People who choose rationally change their decisions when circumstances change. They respond to changes in incentives. An incentive is just a reason for doing something. If the cost of doing something goes up, people do less of it. If the benefit of doing something goes up, people do more of it. For example, if hamburgers become cheap, people eat more of them. If new information becomes available, showing that hamburgers will kill you, people eat fewer of them. These changes in incentives change behavior. Economists talk a lot about rational people making decisions at the margin. What they really mean is that people decide whether to do a little bit more of something or a little bit less of something. For example, if you run a business growing and selling potatoes, you might consider growing a little bit more. To figure out if that's a good idea, you'd want to compare the marginal benefit, the benefit of making a bit more money from growing a few more potatoes, to the marginal cost, the value of the other stuff that could have been done with the resources you used to grow a few more potatoes. If the marginal benefit is greater than the marginal cost, you grow a few more potatoes. If not, then you don't. We'll explore this topic in excruciating detail later. Okay, we got a bit sidetracked there, but now we're back to the key economic concepts. Compared to the general public, economists are much more supportive of the idea that things work out well when people are allowed to buy and sell things to each other. In particular, economists overwhelmingly believe that people in different countries are made wealthier when they are allowed to trade with each other without any tariffs, quotas, or other government restrictions on trade. 
Trade is just what it sounds like, the exchange of goods and resources between people or between geographic areas. So Japan sells cars to the U.S., and the U.S. sells financial services to Japan. That's trade. When economists talk about markets, we don't literally mean a building or a tent on a street corner with stuff being sold in it. Rather, we mean the set of buyers and sellers interacting with each other. So if an economist talks about the market for apples, he or she means all those apple buyers and apple sellers talking to each other, trading money and apples to each other. Economists again differ from the general public in that they tend to believe, with some disagreement, that when people buy and sell things at whatever prices they want, they tend to be made happier. This is not to suggest that markets always work. There is a large literature on market failure. When markets fail, governments might be able to improve the situation. Those should be considered special cases, however. Before you learn how markets fail, you need to understand how they succeed. We will do a lot of this, particularly using the supply and demand model. There are other important ideas that some textbooks state as fundamental economic concepts. For example, maybe the fact that inflation is caused by government printing money too quickly is an important economic concept. Or perhaps the idea that economists try to look for hidden secondary effects of a policy change is something important to economics. I don't think so, however. These and other concepts are important implications of the ideas discussed above, but up to this point, I wanted to focus only on the absolutely most important, most fundamental economic ideas. There are many subdisciplines within economics. They can be roughly grouped into microeconomics and macroeconomics. Microeconomics concerns itself with economic decision making on a small scale. It focuses on consumers, workers, businesses, usually called firms, and how they interact through markets. Microeconomics might even consider the interaction of a couple different markets at the same time. When one gets much bigger than that, however, one starts to get into macroeconomics. Macroeconomics concerns itself with economic aggregates, which are measures of how the economy overall is doing. Examples of economic aggregates are GDP, which tries to measure the value of stuff produced, inflation, which is a measure of how prices go up over time, and unemployment, which is, well, it's how many people are not employed, isn't it? And now something that is worth remembering, but not big enough to count as a key principle. Ceteris paribus is a Latin phrase that means other things the same, or other things equal. As I said before, economists use models to describe the world. When we are constructing an economic model, we have to assume away some complications. By assuming that other things are the same, we mean that we're only going to change one little thing and see what our model predicts. So, for example, if we want to know how consumers will react if the price of bananas goes up, we will assume that the price of bananas is the only thing changing. Incomes aren't changing, the prices of other fruits aren't changing, there are no recent discoveries about bananas curing cancer, and so on. Once we are comfortable with our basic model, we might be able to change more than one thing at a time and see what happens. Always start simple, however. You'll see what I mean when we see the production possibilities frontier, our first model. Let me say a little bit more about economic models. Most economics classes are really a series of models, each designed to describe a particular situation. You go from model to model, learning how they work and when they should be applied. This video series proceeds in a similar manner. The first model we'll see is the production possibilities frontier, which is in either the next video or the video after that, depending on whether you decide to watch the next video. The next video is optional. It's about a book by Brian Kaplan called The Myth of the Rational Voter and how it changed the way I teach. The video will give you some ideas to look out for and perhaps give you a better idea of how an economist's view of the world differs from a non-economist's view of the world. It's a short video, but it's not essential. The real economic modeling begins in the video after that. Trade, production possibilities, and more trade.